Hey, it's Mike here, and today we are gonna talk about roids. Not what you're thinking, thyroids. The type of roids you inject into your thigh. Okay, no more jokes for the whole video, I'm sorry. We're talking about thyroid health here. In particular, we're gonna look at diet and hypothyroidism, and we're gonna do that by looking on a variety of research on things from the prevalence of hypothyroidism by the type of diet or different autoimmune causes, as well as some interesting case studies at the end of people reversing their hypothyroidism. Back to the basics for a split second, your thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped gland on your neck that makes some of your hormones that are responsible for metabolism, for example, and hypothyroidism, like hypoglycemia being not enough blood sugar, is not enough thyroid activity. Hypo, not enough. And hypothyroidism is considered common in the US at least, where about 2.4% of the population have it, which is 7.2 million people, and it mainly affects women, but men do still get it. A common metric for this disease that doctors look at is your thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, which is essentially asking the question, is your body trying to stimulate or jumpstart your thyroid back into action because its activity is low? And under the umbrella of hypothyroidism, we're also gonna look a little bit at autoimmune thyroiditis, which includes Hashimoto's, again, all can result in not enough thyroid activity. But when you think of thyroid, you probably think of iodine, perhaps an iodine deficiency? You may or may not know that iodine is a precursor to some thyroid hormones. That is what was hardwired into my head that a thyroid issue is probably an iodine deficiency. But when I actually looked at the research, I was amazed to see that in developed countries at least, excess iodine may be more of a problem. From this study, you may have heard, quote, more than adequate or excess iodine levels are unsafe and may lead to hypothyroidism and autoimmune thyroiditis. And from another study, quote, exposure to high concentrations of iodine might also decrease the release of thyroid hormone. Hopping back to that first study, they comment on the results of a study in Eastern Europe with quote, it showed that the prevalence of hypothyroidism was an increasing trend accompanied by iodine intake. So as iodine intake went up, so did hypothyroidism. And the researchers of that study concluded that most cases cases of hypothyroidism were autoimmune thyroiditis. So that sort of flew in the face of what I was made to believe, that iodine deficiency was the main cause of hypothyroidism, but it continues on a clinical level. Another study found that when a group of people with Hashimoto's were given 250 micrograms of iodine supplements daily, their thyroid dysfunction was worse than the control group. And according to my calculations, the average person in the US would be getting 400 micrograms per day if all the salt that they ate was iodized and 150 micrograms, just so you know, is the recommended amount. And on a population-wide level, adding iodine to salt may not necessarily help this particular issue, though it may be helping to prevent mental disabilities and things like that. After adding iodine to the salt supply, quote, the prevalence of autoimmune thyroiditis in Greek children was three times greater than it was seven years prior. And in terms of goiters, an enlarged thyroid, <laughs> <laughs> on a large thyroid that can be visible on your neck. In China, they did a study and found that in areas where iodine levels in the water were high, up to 65% of children had goiters, which is a lot. And that is mirrored by studies showing that high iodine intake of over 500 micrograms a day was shown to increase thyroid volume in children. Now, I'm not saying be afraid of iodine. Obviously, you still need to get enough iodine, but this is the opposite of what I previously believed, and I think the opposite of how most people's home remedies go, which would be, oh, I found out I have a thyroid issue. I'm just gonna go and smash in some iodine, or at least increase iodine somewhat. But this information at least would make somebody maybe wanna go get their iodine levels tested, maybe do a pee test or something like that. We are the country of excess after all. Now, I am a vegan, in case you didn't know, in case you didn't see my channel name, and if you didn't know that, don't, don't stop watching, but statistics like what I'm about to show you are part of what made me go vegan in the first place. As this population study found, vegans had half, less than half, the hypothyroidism risk of their omnivore counterparts. That is pretty unbelievable, and there is a stepwise increase in hypothyroidism risk as more animal products are introduced. In other studies, the same relationship can be seen for BMI, the more animal products, the heavier, with vegans in the normal BMI range, the only ones in many studies. And it's sort of a which came first situation, but we know that hypothyroidism can mess with your metabolism and lead to weight gain, but some are now hypothesizing that weight gain 
can also contribute to hypothyroidism. Either way, as this study mentions, a higher BMI leads to a lower quality of life in people with hypothyroidism, so staying at a healthy weight is better. Of course, there are some articles out there that can be used to try and scare people from being vegan for fear of their own thyroid health. A couple of you sent those to me, which encouraged the creation of this video. Here's one such article which is hot off the press, claiming that one of the reasons you need cow's milk is because of iodine. There are many things wrong with this claim, but I just want to hand it over to Dr. Greger on Bite Size Vegan. Um, and also, uh, people that drink dairy milk, they use to uh, what are called teat dips to, to, to prevent mastitis. Um, they, uh, they dip the cow's teats in an iodine-containing solution like betadine. And some of that iodine then leaches into the milk, and so uh, just that disinfection process um, can uh, be a source of iodine for milk drinkers. And this is really just indirect supplementation. Just say no to teat dips. I know you have the willpower. On to the next article, which is why you need to eat meat to maintain a healthy thyroid. My favorite of these is number three, that you need to eat more saturated fat. They're actually telling you that you need to eat more saturated fat to raise your cholesterol to then have healthy thyroid functioning. The fact that vegans have lower levels of cholesterol and half the risk of hypothyroidism should be enough to discredit this notion entirely. But as this study mentioned, those with hypothyroidism can have worse lipid control, their cholesterol can therefore be higher. And so I don't think people with hypothyroidism need to be told to <laughs> raise their cholesterol. Then they point to how you should eat more meat to get amino acids, tyrosine and tryptophan, specifically because they are precursors to neurotransmitters. And as I mentioned in both my Parkinson's video and my depression video, having a lower animal protein diet means that it's actually easier for those two amino acids to cross the blood brain barrier. They're not being outcompeted. They're not being crowded out by an excess of other amino acids that are in animal protein. To be fair, tyrosine is also a precursor to thyroid hormones, but you can easily get enough on a vegan diet. And really quick, since I am talking about plants and thyroids, I should cover the topic of goitrogens, which are compounds that allegedly can contribute to goiters. There are precursors to these compounds in cruciferous vegetables, for example, but would eating vegetables actually make your condition worse in real life? This study took people with hypothyroidism and added 150 grams of Brussels sprouts, a cruciferous vegetable, and that's about seven or eight Brussels sprouts a day for four weeks, and the results, no change, didn't affect it. But it might be that they were cooked, which neutralizes those potentially goitrogenic compounds. It seems like we need more data. I would definitely consult my doctor if this was an issue I was looking into. But for the rest of the population, these compounds break down into ones that potentially prevent cancer, have been shown to reduce cancer growth and kill cancer, and cancer kills more people than hypothyroidism for sure. Now for an interesting and complicated topic, which hopefully I will make simple, and that is molecular mimicry and the pathogen Yersinia. No, Yersinia. No, Yersinia. No, Yersinia. Just making sure you're still paying attention. You said no more jokes. Molecular mimicry with respect to autoimmune diseases is when a foreign protein makes it into our body and our immune system creates an antibody to attack that, but because that foreign protein is similar enough to our own proteins, we end up attacking some of our own tissues instead. And it just so happens that one amino acid sequence on that pathogen, Yersinia enterocolitica, may be similar enough to our thyroid proteins that it could create that cross-reaction. From this study, people with Hashimoto's have 14 times the prevalence of antibodies for Yersinia than people who don't have the disease. But how do we get exposed to this bacteria? What could get our antibodies going crazy like that in the first place? Well, from the CDC, quote, your cineosis is an infection caused most often by eating raw or undercooked pork contaminated with Yersinia enterocolitica bacteria. They go on to say that this causes almost 117,000 illnesses, 640 hospitalizations, and 35 deaths a year. But vegans are totally crazy for not wanting to use the same cookware as everybody else. Complete this, there's no basis in fact. So it makes sense that the less pork you prepare and eat, the less of this pathogen you're exposed to, the less antibodies you need to create, and the less thyroid attacking your body would do. 
Taking this principle even further, though research on it has yet to be done, some have proposed that processed lunch meats or any of those mix-it-all-together meats contains actual pig thyroid, which could create the same autoimmune reaction. After all, I know a dude who just got a pig valve put in his heart. So not so different after all. Okay, on another note, let's have a little bit of fun and look at some anecdotes, some personal stories of people reversing their hypothyroidism, and there are many of them within the vegan community. And this really calls for a clinical trial, which hopefully someday will happen, but looking to this woman and her story, she actually tracked her TSH levels going back down to normal over several data points, which is cool. Hair loss can be one result of hypothyroidism and this girl's hair was thinning and then she went on a vegan diet and here she is. After I started on this diet, I felt more energetic. I felt like my hair was growing back and I was getting slimmer and more fit and my skin was getting better. So two weeks ago, I went back to my doctor's to get my annual blood test done. After the results came in, my doctor calls me and he tells me on the phone that he doesn't need to see me because my blood tests are normal. My thyroid was normal. Here's another woman who reversed her hypothyroidism going vegan and she is on Ellen Fisher's show. And I went there basically to get blood work. The doctor, I remember he came into the room, first thing they do, you know, they ask you, well, what are you taking? Are you still taking this, this, mm -hmm. this? And I was like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. And then I get my blood work back and well, He's looking at it, and I had improvements on everything. Even my osteoporosis is reversing. Wow. wow. I suggest checking out her channel, especially if you got them little vegan babies. The vegan babies. I also just found out that there is a vegan kids magazine. I'll link that below as well. And from Carrie Gardner's story, can you imagine getting a letter in the mail just saying that your hypothyroidism was cured? Pretty cool. And there's some more videos such as this one by Vegan Food for Thought. She covers things in addition to diet, some other good habits that she implemented that helped her. So in conclusion, from what is probably just a general improvement of health state, vegans have 50% less hypothyroidism, which is unbelievable. We see people reversing it a lot. That doesn't mean everybody who goes on a vegan diet is gonna be able to reverse it, but this information is very compelling. And in addition to that, going vegan, you are dodging those pathogens that can potentially create some autoimmune cross-reactivity. Finally, the iodine issue is not as clear-cut as we previously thought, and that is worth taking into consideration. All right, I hope this video was helpful. Let me know down below if you have any interesting thyroid experiences. <laughs> uh, that sounds funny. And I just want to say super thanks to my Patreon people and those who have bought the ebook. Because of you guys, I have been able to take my master's in public health classes without taking out any loans, which is super awesome. And I also just happened to make that cookbook a $10 perk on the Patreon for those that are interested. All right, thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. If your food gets its nutrients from teat dip, it may be time to reevaluate your dietary practices. No Yersinia. No Yersinia. No Yersinia. Molecu molecular McRim I don't eat humans, they're just too similar.